Hello everyone, welcome to The Raw Take. I'm your host, Rob Reed. This is your review for the August 18th, 2021 edition of AEW Dynamite. Uh, another fun show. Uh, let's get into it. Uh, the show starts out, we see uh, John Moxley and uh, uh, Eddie Kingston coming out. But before they get to the ring, they're attacked by 2.0 and Daniel Garcia. And they get on the mic, and they say, they said, uh, we're supposed to have a, a tornado tag match tonight. We want it, we're not going to wait any longer. Get out here now. We'll have it now. Uh, so that brings out Sting, and uh, Sting, Darby comes out uh, from behind uh, 2.0, attacks. Match gets started. Huge brawl throughout the arena. Really cool to see. Darby gets chunked into something else, as he always does, which is always a fun visual. Uh, 2.0 have stacked a tape, put a table, set up a table. They do a double power bomb through the table on, on Sting. Sting pops right up. Darby comes back, hits a drop kick. Sting grabs both guys, hits them both with a scorpion death drop, stacks them, puts them both, does a double uh, scorpion death lock, and they tap out. Really fun match. Uh, uh, at one point, there Eddie, Eddie Kingston does come back out at one point and uh, takes out Daniel Garcia. So that was really fun. Really fun match. Sting continues to look really good, uh, especially at 62 years old. Sting, how it, it's amazing that you see how some how one company will treat legends will take legends and just like you see WWE takes a legends they'll either be a Goldberg where they put them in matches where they shouldn't be in big uh, title matches or matches that they don't need to be in and, and it makes everybody look bad. Or you have AEW who uses their legends to both. One, they always accentuate their strengths. Like in Sting's case, they're, they're putting in, in tag matches, with, usually with people that are going to make him look really good. And also... He's there to make put over Darby Allen, make Darby Allen into a bigger star than the than he already is. Uh, and with 2.0, they're you know they took these guys who couldn't even get on television when they were in NXT hardly at all. They come into AEW and they're immediately put into a Pretty, pretty high profile, quick feud with Darby and Sting, and also involving John Moxley and Eddie Kingston. That's a big difference. Yeah, they lost. Yeah, they lose. But they're already coming in. They 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 look good in defeat. They don't look like chumps. I mean, they attack, they come out and already attack uh, Moxley and Kingston. So they already look credible going into their match against Sting and Darby. Yes, Sting does the pop-up, he gets right up. You can take it or leave it, but Sting has always been the, that's been part of Sting's character for a long time. Uh, he... He's Superman. He's 
you know. And he's still capable of being that guy. There's a difference between, and I will tell, and I'll explain. It's the makeup. It's it's one hundred percent the makeup. Sting will always look like Sting because he wears the makeup. Someone like Goldberg or any any other older wrestler, they're as they get older, they're they're going to start looking their age. I'm sure if Sting didn't wear the makeup, he'd look like another old guy. So, but when he wears the paint, he act, he still looks special. He still looks like Sting. So I think that's a big difference. I really do. Uh, next, we have... Uh, Oh, next we get a, a video package from earlier in the day. We see that uh, the big announcement from uh, Sammy Guevara, he has his girlfriend there. He proposes to her. She says yes. So a nice fun thing. Another, again, uh, Sammy Guevara involved in a heart heartwarming segment we go to the back we see uh sean spears he congratulates the new couple uh and he invites uh sammy's fiance <clears throat> for one night to join the pinnacle because as we always say when you're in the pinnacle you're always on top uh i thought that was a funny line we get into a really damn good match between Sammy Guevara and Sean Spears. I will admit, I don't think they needed to have some of the kickouts that they had. There's a point where uh, Sean Spears kicks out of the 630 senton, but it, it, it doesn't really go anywhere towards the end of the match because all Sammy did was hit a couple knees and did the GTH for the win. Like, it's not like uh, Sean Spears got any more offense in. Uh, so, I probably would have ended it with the 630. But, the crowd reaction when Sean Spears kicked out it was a really good, the crowd bought into the near fall. So I will give them that, but I do think that the 630 should have just been the finish. Since, like, the match didn't really have anything else to warrant that kick out, if you ask me. But still, really, probably Sean Spears' best match in AEW, by far. Uh, after that, we see, uh, Tony Schiavone is talking to Christian Cage in the back. Don Callis shows up. Uh, he says, I'm, he kind of completely blows off the fact that Christian Cage beat Omega last week. Uh, Cage points out that he took the title, the Impact title last week. He said, and he finishes up by saying uh, you've always said you thought you were the smartest guy in the room but you're still just a carny piece of shit I thought that was I think that's really kind of fun he's, he's the uh, guy that gets to drop the drop the dirty word every week uh, next we have a nice little uh, video package for Dante Martin. Uh, I, I I do like that even if they're not using, they do these little vignettes letting people go, remember this guy. Remember this guy. Uh, <clears throat> he's going to be our 
one of our future stars, which he obviously is. I another thing I do like the AEW does is if a tag wrestler gets hurt, they don't just immediately stop letting the other tag partner wrestle. They still get to do their stuff. They still get to work. They're letting Dante Martin be a singles guy, which is really cool. He's been doing amazing stuff in the ring. So I like that. Uh, next, uh, Tony Schiavone. Tony Schiavone did a lot of work tonight. Uh, he was moving a lot. I mean, I'm sure a lot of it was pre-taped, but still. Uh, Tony Schiavone is in the ring with Dan Lambert. Uh, Dan Lambert starts going on one of his, his rants. His old man yells at cloud rants. Uh, he uh, has, this, this time he's brought uh, oh, Andre Arlovsky and Junior Dos Santos. Would, I was surprised it was, per, surprised it was JDS. As I've always thought of JDS as like one of the more likable guys in <laughs> UFC history. He's never come off as a bad guy, like at all. <laughs> He's always seemed like one of the sweetest guys. <laughs> to the point I was mad at the crowd a few years ago when they booed him out of the building because he lost a fight to, uh, lost a fight and... He was like, why are you booing me? What did I do? So I was surprised to see him being a heel. Uh, but Dan Lambert goes on one of his long rants. Uh, uh, eventually, uh, Lance Archer comes out. I do think it's funny that he was basically talking about cancel culture and all that. Uh, be, like Just being the old man uh rant uh some people aren't a fan of it I, and i get why but i i was kind of into his whole sh him acting like a just an old fart uh, uh lance archer comes out but before he gets to the ring he's jumped by uh uh scorpio sky and ethan page uh and they leave leave him land and then Lambert laughs at him, and that's the end. I will say another problem I do have is they tend to cut away to the next segment too quickly sometimes. They don't let, sometimes they don't let uh, moments breathe. Uh, tonight did have that happen a lot. There was a lot of segments where just they did something and then immediately cut to the next thing. Uh, but they try. They do try to squeeze in a lot into a two-hour show, which I do give them credit for because we see uh, Raws where they don't. They have absolutely nothing for a three-hour show, so at least they try to put stuff in. Uh, next, we see uh, Chris Jericho. Uh, he's Another, an interview with Jericho. Uh, he said he, he has momentum going in against MJF. Uh, he said just because he can't... He, he said he might not have, be able to have his music, but he has 5,000 fans that are going to be singing his music. So that's a, ni a nice little precursor to what comes up in the main event. The Young Bucks... Next, we have the Young Bucks defending the uh, AEW Tag Team titles against uh, Jurassic Express. Another really, really, really fun match. Uh, there is a lot of distractions in this match. I will give, you, give people that. But with what comes later, it makes sense tonight. Uh, there's a lot, like all of the elite end up causing different distractions. Uh, eventually, it's enough for the Bucks to pick up the win. 
But right after that, we later we see that in the back, the Tony Schiavone is with the Young Bucks, and he announces that there is going to be a, a, an Eliminator tournament the next few nights. Uh, it's uh, going to be uh, uh, Jurassic Express, uh, the Lucha Bros, uh, Private Party, and the Varsity Blondes. And the winner of that tournament will face the Young Bucks in a still cage for the titles at All Out. Uh, I think... I think it's probably going to be uh, Lucha Bros. It's either that or they're going to go back to uh, Jurassic Express and they'll get their win. Uh, one or the other. Uh, either way, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with just about anybody in that tournament. And I, could, I would definitely like to see Lucha Bros and Young Bucks in a steel cage tearing it up. That would be really cool. Uh, we, uh, we get a uh, interview with uh, uh, Brett Baker. Uh, she introduces Jamie Hayter. Uh, she says she's the answer to everything that's wrong here. Uh, Jamie Hayter uh, uh, challenges Red Velvet to a match. So we're going to get that next week. Uh, next we see Matt Hardy talking about his issues with the best friends. Uh, it, it looks like they're probably setting up uh, Matt Hardy and uh, Orange Cassidy at the pay-per-view. Uh, next, Shav Tony Schiavone again in the ring. Uh, introduces Paul White, who says he has a big announcement. This brings out QT Marshall. He does make make have a quip of when we're when in AEW we don't uh, uh, make hints and not uh, about something and not deliver on it, which is another nice little nod to. What's happening Friday? Early oh, or, and earlier in the night, uh, Kenny Omega was wearing a chick magnet shirt. Uh, CM. Uh, so we get that. Uh, still a lot of fun little nods to CM Punk on Friday. Look, if CM Punk's not showing up Friday, uh, like AEW will lose every bit of their viewership. Like. Like, there's no way they're doing that. Uh, uh, but QT Marshall comes out and he says, uh, there's a reason why uh, Tony Khan hired you as an announcer and not as an ring performer. He put shows it up on the Tron, and there's like a big picture, basically of Big Show's ass. Basically, a big picture of uh, Paul White's ass, uh, but it, really, it's to show his a lot of uh, scars and uh, just surgery photos of his spot of his back and hips, and he's had so many a bunch of surgeries over the last few years. Uh, Big Show interrupts him and says, you know, you're kind of taking me off. He said, I I told you I had a big announcement. That big announcement is I t got to talk to Tony Khan, and he and he uh, gave me a match at All Out against you. I'm not sure if I'm totally into uh, Paul White versus QT Marshall, but it should just be a quick, like, three-minute squash match. Should be at least somewhat fun, even if it's just a match to kind of cool down the crowd a little bit. <laughs> I'm guessing it's probably going to be about mid-show, so 
so as not to burn out the crowd before the end. That's my guess. Uh, uh, I mean, it's not the match, a match I'm particularly uh, looking forward to, but it should still be a, lo a little bit of fun. Uh, I'm sure the crowd will pop for a couple punch, knockout punches, choke slam. That should be it. Like. Now, maybe Big Caveman uh, Nick, Big Caveman looking dude, Nick Camarado, could maybe do a body slam or something on Paul White to get a big reaction. But other than that, it should be just Big Show beating the crap out of uh, QT. Uh, I do, I, I have to say, I get a kick out of the whale before, as at the beginning of. Uh, Paul White's music. Uh, next, we see a quick backstage segment with uh, Mark Sterling and Jade Cargill. And they say that uh, on Rampage, they're going to face uh, uh, Kira Hogan, which is really awesome to see. Uh, it was also announced that Kira Hogan is going to be the last, as the was as the final entrant in the big uh, battle royal at uh, AEW's Empower event. Uh, that's cool. Uh, it's cool to see her getting a lot of uh, big matches and big shows. That's really cool to see. Uh, again, Don Callis. Uh, um, yeah, uh, now we go to Taz, and uh, he introduces Hook, introduces Hook in the ring, and then he introduces Ricky Starks, who comes out. Uh, Ricky Starks uh, uh, is calling out Brian Cage. They go to the back. And it shows uh, Cage laid out with uh, Powerhouse Hobbs, uh, who's over top of him. Hobbs picks him up to continue a beat down, but Cage start Brian Cage starts coming back, uh, and it, like immediately, uh, the rest of Team Taz run af after, uh, and that's the end of the segment. That's where I can say they, they sometimes don't let segments give get enough time to breathe because they're like they just run off to fight Brian Cage and then they just move on to the next segment. So that's that's where sometimes pacing sometimes becomes an issue, but it's not like egregious. Uh, next, Tony Schiavone is interviewing Pac, uh, and Penta, and Ray Phoenix. Pac is hyping up his match with uh, Andrade at All Out. Uh, Chavo, Chavo and Andrade come out and they say uh, excuse me mm. they say that they'll only do the match if, as long as Pac uh, agrees to their terms and they have like a phone book sized uh, stack of of papers as their conditions. Uh, I'm guessing the main condition is if uh, the, it's just my guess that if Pac loses the uh, the Lucha Bros will then work for uh, Andrade. Next we have a uh, match between Thunder Rosa and Penelope Ford. It starts out a little bit sloppy, but at, by the end, it becomes a real, actually really good uh, technical match. Like, surprisingly technical. Like, a lot of submission-based wrestling, which I thought was really cool. And, and they're, I like that they're making Thunder Rosa like this really 
tech that doesn't have to fight her way out of like submissions. She like is able to transition into her own, and that's how she wins. She transitions out of a Muda lock into like her own like own sleeper hold move, and that's how she wins. I thought it would look real. It was really a, a really cool way to win the match. Uh, and Thunder Rosa continues to be like the most over person in the company. The pops she gets when she comes out are some of the most insane, insanely loud pops I've heard in a long time. And it's really cool to see. Uh, uh, next, Tony Schiavone again in the back. He's talking to Arn and Brock Anderson. Uh, Brock Anderson calls out uh, Malachi Black because uh, fir first Arn talks about how uh, Malachi kicked him in the head a few weeks ago. Uh, Brock uh, very stupidly challenges Malachi to a fight. Even, even Arn is trying to stopping from doing that but uh, Brock said he's not asking for a match he's telling uh, his dad that he wants a match with Malachi so next week we're going to see the live murder of uh, Brock Anderson uh, that's going to be some fun stuff and next week we're going to have uh, Excal uh, Excalibur announces that uh, uh, Friday uh, is the first match in the Tag Team Eliminator Tournament. That is going to be uh, Private Party. Or, sorry. Uh, sorry, next week. Uh, Varsity Blondes take on Penta and Phoenix. And Friday, uh, Private yeah. 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 Sorry. Next week, Varsity Blondes versus Penta and Phoenix. Friday is going to be Private Party versus Jurassic Express. That should be a lot of fun. And then John Moxley has a promo, and he says he is going to face uh, Daniel Garcia in the main event on Rampage. Daniel Garcia, another relatively unknown to, like, mainstream wrestling fans. Don't, didn't really know who Daniel Garcia was. Another young guy who they're building up through having matches with big names. He may not win, but we're talking, he's having matches with the likes of John Moxley and Darby Allen. Yeah, they're not going to lose matches very often. Those are your top stars, so they're obviously going to win. But when you see someone like Daniel Garcia putting up a really good fight, say like last week when he looked really good against Darby Allen, I'm sure they're going to make him look really good against John Moxley. So that's really cool. We see the stuff with Wheeler Yuta and the uh, best friends. That's really cool to see. So I'm, I'm, it's really nice to see AEW really focusing on like these young guys that are going, obviously going to be their core in the next like five years. It's really cool to see. Next we see uh, Miro. He said he's not, he will not forgive uh, Fuego Del Sol because he didn't earn the contract he was given. Uh, I thought that was really cool. He says he speaks to God every day and pleases his uh, wife every night. That was another fun line. Uh, finally, we come to the main event. Uh, uh, it's the fifth labor of Jericho 
uh, MJF comes out first, and the entire crowd actually sings the song Judas pretty, pretty well in sync. I will give them that. It started out a little rocky, but of course by the time they got to the chorus, they were singing it fine. It was obvious, like the entire crowd were like holding their phones up, and you could see them reading the lyrics off. But I thought it was a a pretty pretty good visual seeing the like the entire crowd in a cappella singing Judas. I thought that was really cool. Uh, the match was again really good i think this is probably the best match uh jericho has had in his five labors probably since the nick gage match you know and even that was more of just a hardcore based match death match but in here here it was that he he looked good he looked he actually looked young <laughs> He he didn't actually look 51 years old here. I, it was a really good match. Uh, eventually, uh, there's even a good uh, moment where MJF does the Jericho bit of holding the camera, turning around while flipping off the crowd. Uh, he, and as he turns around, he turns right into Jericho, smiles, punches punches the camera which is always a funny way of doing it because uh, he's obviously not hitting the person he's hitting the camera but still it's a fun it's a fun looking visual uh, eventually there's a moment where uh, uh, MJF goes to grab the diamond the diamond ring to hit Jericho the referee sees it, stops him. From you, Jericho grabs Floyd from under the uh, ring apron, hits MJF in the gut. But as he's going to hit the Judas effect, he stops himself. Uh, but this allows MJF to hit Jericho with a Judas effect, and then he puts him in the armbar. Jericho is able to turn it into a two into a two count but MJF immediately puts it right back into the arm bar wrenches back and eventually uh, which is funny just as JR is saying I don't think I've ever seen Jericho submit like immediately Jericho submits <laughs> but MJF won won the match 100% clean I really like that. Uh, the right person went over here. I really am surprised that this was not uh, this was not a match at the pay per view. I am surprised that they did it here instead. But uh, and at the end of the day, they went with the right person winning the match. He should MJF should have won. He's the he's the big star for the future. So he should be winning this match. Uh, they always make MJF's matches. Any singles matches that MJF is in, they always make a special occasion. This wasn't it wasn't any different. So this is this is I really like this. Uh, I thought it was a f really good show. Uh, yes, there was some pacing stuff here and there but overall i thought it was a really good show uh if you like this video give it a like subscribe to the channel for more videos comment down below follow me on twitter at mr rob reed and i will see you in the next video